Inspired. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Lord, may I hear and receive your word today. Father, the words that you have given to, to myself may it come out with clarity, may we have understanding, may we be able to follow the reading of the word. May you, through the Holy Spirit, make it applicable to each of our lives. Today's text is the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And we want to read verses 19 and down to 28. That's what we want to espouse on. Let us give attention to the reading of God's Word first. That's John, chapter 1, verses 19 through... 28. You having received it. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Are you the one, or who are you, so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, and said to him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. <clears throat> It is he who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. <clears throat> Today, our section, verses 19. 19 to 28, we are entitling the, the testimony of John the Baptist with the subtitle, Who Are You? Part 1. I want you to focus on our purpose. I want us to consider how we need to be clear on who we are in God's kingdom so that we can effectively point others to Jesus for salvation. Our text shows us that John the Baptist was a man who was clear on who he was not and who he was. He was also clear on who Jesus is. So he was able to point others clearly to Jesus as the only Savior whom they desperately needed. At this particular point in our study, we leave the prologue and we begin a very long, extensive section beginning in verse 19 that will end in chapter 12, verse 54. And this long section will amass testimony after testimony regarding Jesus as being the Son of God, 
the whom, the one in whom all should believe. Now as we seek to finish our chapter 1, it's going to present to us the witness of the one that we know as the forerunner, John the Baptist. There are two purposes for this section. We want to make note of them. The first purpose is to show John's witness to Jesus at the inception or the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And purpose number two is we want to clarify John's relationship to Jesus as being one of the witnesses rather than being a rival or one who was antagonistic to Jesus. Now we are introduced to the ministry of John back in chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, and we saw three aspects of John the Baptist's testimony regarding Jesus. If you remember, the first thing we learned in those verses was that John told us that he was not the light, but he was simply sent to bear witness to the light and his aim was that all might believe through him. Now those three points they are going to outline for us the rest of this chapter verses 19 to 51. In the section that we're going to be looking at today in verses 19 to 28 John will testify that he is not the light in section 29 to 34, he's going to testify to that him that he is the one who bears witness to the light. And then we're finishing out this chapter in verse 35 through 51. We will see John's witness as it brings fruit as several of the disciples of himself, John the Baptist, will now believe in Jesus and will begin to follow Jesus. In today's message, we simply want to cover the first point where we find John testifying that he himself is not the light. Let's make sure that we review what is said in the prologue regarding John the Baptist in John's Gospel. In the first chapter, let's go up a few verses, we read in verse number 6, there came a man sent from God whose name was John first thing that we recognize about this man, John the Baptist, is that he's sent from God. Make note of that. He's sent from God. He said in verse 7, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. Now he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. So we understand John the Baptist was a man sent from God and let it be he came to bear witness of the light. And the light has been identified as Jesus. He came to bear witness regarding Jesus' ministry. And then in verse 15 we get our other fact regarding John the Baptist. John testified about him and cried out saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. John the Baptist was a man sent from God. John was one who came to bear witness of the light, which is a reference to Jesus. And verse 15 teaches us that he bore witness to the preeminence and the pre-existence of that light. In other words, he gave record of the pre-existence of 
Jesus, he bore witness to the preeminence and the existence of Jesus. As John in his gospel moves now to the more narrative part of the gospel, he has given us great theology in the very first 18 verses in identifying Jesus as being God, showing us the deity of Christ. He has given to us the rejection and the acceptance of Christ as he would come into this world. There would be some who would reject him, some who would receive him. He would come among his own, and his own should have known him, should have recognized him because of the Old Testament teachings. He would be rejected by his own. John gives us a more spiritual incarnation of Christ, God coming in the flesh. He uses the phrase, the Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled or made a tent among us. He tells us about him saying the glory of the Word being flesh. His testimony is what we will study now. This is the testimony of John the Baptist. He's talking about John the Baptist even though he only refers to him by first name only. John the Baptist. John, the author of the Apostle John, the author of the Gospel of John, does not identify himself in this Gospel by the name John. So usually when we come across this single name John, he's talking about John the Baptist. Now remember our thesis. Our thesis, our goal in today's lesson is to help us to consider what needs to take place for us to give a clear <coughs> understanding of who we are in God's kingdom so that we can effectively point others to Jesus. Jesus is the one that's needed for salvation. And we need to point people to Jesus. And so therefore we're going to use this text this morning to help us to understand how to appoint or how to give direction to people in regarding Jesus. It brings us to our first point. To effectively point others to Jesus, we need to be clear on who we are not. To effectively point others to Jesus, we need to be clear on who we are not. Verses 19, 20, and 21 will give us the context for this particular point. In this section, verse 19 to 21, the Apostle John sets the tension that will mount between the religious crowd of that day versus Christ and the followers of Christ. This testimony given by John the Baptist will be given over a span of three different days to three different groups. Three different days to three different groups. We're dealing with day one now and then we will follow up in another day in verse 35, 36 as we move on progressively to the end of of this chapter, John will take us through three different time periods interacting with three different groups of people. And each time, John the Apostle will speak of Christ in a different way. And he will emphasize a distinct, separate aspect of the ministry of Christ to these different groups. 
Now I believe the events of this verse, of these verses take place after John's baptism of Jesus, after Jesus has been baptized of John, these events that we have before us take place. The first thing that we are to notice in verse 19, that is the testimony of who? Oh, that was solid. I believe with all of our translations, it should tell us who it is, who is giving us the testimony. It's the testimony of whom? John. 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 John the Baptist. Now, we know some things about John the Baptist, don't we? We know, number one, that John the Baptist came from a priestly family. And in particular, the Gospel of Luke teaches us that he came from the tribe of Levites. We know that his birth was a miraculous birth. We know that his father was a priest and his mother had been barren for many years and miraculously the angel of the Lord communicates to Zechariah, his father, that his wife would give birth to a son and they were to call him Jesus. He begins his ministry in what's known as the Jordan Valley when he was approximately 29 or 30 years of old and he boldly proclaims the need for spiritual repentance and he boldly proclaims the need for preparation for the coming of the Messiah. We also know that he was a cousin of Jesus Christ and that he serves as the forerunner and we like to call him the prophetic forerunner the prophetic forerunner in that he it had been prophesied that he would be the forerunner to Jesus the text says when the Jew when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites, notice where they're from. They're from Jerusalem. This is probably referring to the Sanhedrin, which was the main governing body of the Jewish nation at that time. And the Sanhedrin was controlled by a family of high priests. And so they will employ priests and Levites who would become interested in John's ministry. Both his message and his baptism. They would be interested in both his message and his baptism. In the 19th verse he first mentions the Jews. This is going to be a term that John will use frequently in his gospel approximately about 70 times. Sometimes as we have in the second chapter of John verse 6, he will use the term Jew in a neutral sense, not good or bad, but he will use it in chapter 4 verse 22 in a good sense, and then he will use it in uh, 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 a more negative sense as we move on in the gospel as he speaks of the Jews as becoming hostile toward the ministry of Jesus. Because of John's frequent use of this term, Jews, some individuals, some scholars, and some theologians have accused John of being anti-Semitic. But we need to keep in mind, it would be hard for John to be anti-Semitic because he himself was a Jew, as well as Jesus. He's not attacking the Jewish nation. He's not attacking the Jewish people. Uh, uh, but he is emphasizing what was right or what was good regarding Judaism. 
He was trying to convert. He was trying to convey the message of the Old Testament to his nation. So we see, first of all, we see the context. We see who we have. We have the players on the scene. We have John the Baptist, and this is going to be his testimony. We have Jews that sent to him, and, the, and it's going to be made up of priests and Levites. And we said, presumably, it's all from the Sanhedrin. And they're going to come from Jerusalem, and they're going to inquire about him and his ministry. Him and his ministry. First thing we come across, they asked him a question. Who are you? Who are you? And he confessed. And he did not deny. But confessed. I am not the Christ. Now, what is assumed that what has to be implied there is that the question has been asked him, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you the promised one? Because there had been expectations, there had been waitings for the Messiah. It was running high in the religious crowd of the people of Israel. They had long waited for deliverance from Roman rule, they had long desired to have the prestige and the power among world powers that had been experienced under the rulership of David and Solomon, based upon different promises that they had read and studied about in Hebrew scripture. The people were expecting one day for God to send a person, a great person, a, a mighty person who would be a deliverer. But their one-track mind only saw the deliverer in a physical sense. But they knew from Scripture that this deliverer would represent God in a very unique and powerful way. And that this deliverer would usher in an age of righteousness and peace that would include deliverance from foreign rule. So you have to understand their mindset. They are, they are looking for a Messiah. They are anticipating a Messiah based upon Old Testament scripture. And he would be a deliverer. Even though he would bring in an age of righteousness and peace, their mind was sitting around Deliverance in the physical sense. So when the religious leaders in, in Jerusalem, when they get ear about John's popularity, John is in the wilderness and he's preaching and, and he's baptizing and large crowds of people are coming to him, they decided that they needed to check him out. They needed to find out for themselves, is this the fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture? John was a very puzzling man to them. He was of priestly descent. He met that criteria. Uh, he could have been a part of their crowd, the religious crowd. He could have... I've uh, 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 been living in comfortable uh, situations, in comfortable housing and cities. He could have dressed in more conservative robes as they wore in those days. He could have really been functioning as a part of the religious establishment as his dad had done. But instead, he was living in the wilderness. He was living in a very unconventional way. His message wasn't a friendly message. His message didn't come to firm up the establishment. It didn't come to back up the status quo. He seemed a bit odd. <clears throat> he didn't eat the, uh, 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 the regular meal that were offered to the priest. 
So, naturally, their minds would begin to wonder, if not, maybe so, is this, could it be, that he is the promised one? He's strange. He's odd, but he preaches with authority. He's, he's baptizing, could it be, could it be? So, they send out a delegation to ask John if he were number one, the Christ. Now you keep in mind, Christ is not Jesus' last name. <laughs> Christ is simply the title. In the Hebrew, the word Christ is Messiah. Is he the Messiah? Or at least John sensed that th this is what they implied behind whatever the question is, who are you? Because the Apostle John, he piles on phrases to indicate that John the Baptist vigorously denied that he was the Christ. And he confessed and did not deny but confessed. And the, and the implication of the verbiage here that he is saying over and over again, I am not the Messiah. I am not the Messiah. I am not the promised one. He confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed. It's as if the Apostle John is saying, I myself heard him confess and not for one instant deny, and this is what he confessed, that he is not the Christ. You have to take away from this phrase strong replies from, from his gut, from, his, from the seat of his emotions. He leaves no room for any doubt about him being the Christ. He's not the Christ. That's the first response. Well, 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 they're not, they're, they're, they really are not satisfied, so they, so they come back and ask him a, 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 a more religious question that's more tied to the Old Testament. Then are you Elijah? They ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? They would have to have gotten this from Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 that the prophet Elijah would return before the Messiah would establish his earthly kingdom. And if John was the forerunner of the Messiah, then he had to be Elijah. That's what they asked him. Remember the angel who announced John's birth said that John would go before Jesus in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. That's what we read in Luke chapter 1 verse 17. Thus indicating that someone other than the literal Elijah would fulfill this prophecy. God would send John, who was like Elijah, but he wasn't Elijah. Are you Elijah? Well, they change the tactics. We're not going to come directly and ask you, are you the Christ? Then what then? Are you Elijah? It was, an, it was, it was another good guess. Uh, he probably looked like Elijah. The description of him was probably more like Elijah, both in a rugged wilderness lifestyle and, and, and definitely his fiery message. We read of Elijah's message in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 2 Kings chapter number 1. But as I stated, it was in Malachi, the last Old Testament prophet, about 400 years prior to this event, states in Malachi 4 and 5 that before the great and terrible day, the Lord God would send Elijah the prophet to restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now this was taken to mean at that day that before the Messiah would come, Elijah literally would come, but again, but again, John's answer was not in the dark. 
he comes out emphatically and says, I am not. Once again, he denies. This denial seems to contradict what Jesus would later state that John was the Elijah of Malachi, chapter 4, as you read in Matthew chapter 11, verse 14, and also in Matthew 17 and 11. But we would understand in that context, Jesus was referring to John being in the spirit of Elijah, in the manner like Elijah, but not like Elijah. Now, why would they think that he was Elijah? Because you remember, Elijah was taken up. He was taken up to God. Elijah did not experience physical death. So, 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 so they naturally thought in their religious context that he would come and fulfill this prophecy. And we just stated that the angel had already predicted to uh, John's father, Zacharias, and he had cited the same prophecy and said that John would go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. Now he made it clear to Zechariah that he wasn't Elijah, but he was going to come in his spirit and in his power. So why does John deny that he is after the likeness of Elijah? Well, I, I, I believe there are several reasons. First of all, John probably knew that some of the Jews were expecting a literal Elijah, who we know did not die, but was carried to heaven in a fiery chariot to return in a spectacular way. John denied that he was, number one, the literal Elijah. And even as we stated, when Jesus referred to him in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 17. Jesus was not speaking of a literal Elijah, but of John coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Also, I believe, John had a very humble opinion of himself. He may not have seen any significance in his ministry, as Jesus would later point out. He may have saw himself fulfilling a very small and insignificant role in the plan of God. No man is what he himself thinks he is. He is only what Jesus knows him to be. John was not interested in building or following after himself. John was not interested in building a ministry after himself known as the latter day Elijah. <laughs> but rather he understood his purpose and he wanted to stay the course. His job was to point others to Jesus, to point out the Christ. So once again, he denies that he is Elijah. Now notice the second half of verse 21. And he said, I am not. Then they said, are you the prophet? Now, 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 now highlight that article, the prophet. Now, it's that, because that's referring to something. He didn't, they didn't say, are you a prophet? But are you the prophet? Now, together, now the delegation, remember the delegation is made up of what? Priests and Levites. They're, they're made up of people from the Sanhedrin. So the delegation, uh, 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 they asked him then, are you the prophet? John's answers is growing increasingly short, if you notice. Now he doesn't say, I am not. He simply says, no. <laughs> he wants to cut off misleading speculations about himself. Now, the religious leaders here, they are referring to when they say the prophet. They're going way back now. They have tried Malachi. They have tried 2 Kings. Now they got to go all the way back to Moses. Moses prophesied about the prophet. Moses. He predicted in Deuteronomy 18 and 15 
Moses prophesied in, in Deuteronomy 1815 that the Lord your God would raise up for you a prophet like me among you from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. The Jews distinguish between the, the latter day prophet and the Messiah, but but every Christian preacher from Paul's day until now understand that the one that Moses was talking about was Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus was the prophet. John understood that he was not the prophet. He doesn't even go there. He doesn't even entertain the thought. He does not even give them time to collect their thoughts and to come back with something else. Just simply, no! No. So now, after he says this, this delegation has nothing positive to put in their report to their leaders. He's not the Messiah. He's not Elijah. He's not the prophet. So there's nothing positive now to take back to Jerusalem. So they have to go back and repeat their question. They're repeating it. We can't go back to Jerusalem empty-handed. The Sanhedrin, the high priest, has sent us out here, man, to find out who you are. You just told us that you're not the Messiah, you're not Elijah, and you're not the prophet. You've got to tell us something. So verse 22, they... They say to him, then, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. Man, they didn't send us out here for nothing. <laughs> they paid for our trip. We came all the way from Jerusalem. We made a two days journey down here to find out who you are. And you have told us, no, I am not. I have not known you got to tell us something. What do you say about yourself? I remember my first point was is that to effectively point others to Jesus, we need to clearly know who we what? Who we are not. Who we are not. I, 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 jumping a little bit forward in my message before we conclude it, I see in the body of Christ today many individuals who don't understand who they're not. <laughs> many see themselves as being something that they're not. That's right. They're wonder workers. Mm -hmm. They are. They are. Uh, are the only ones who have a word. <laughs> they are the prophets. They are, they are the new apostles on the scene. They are the place that's happening. John teaches us to understand who we are not. You don't save nobody. That's all right. Amen. You and I don't save nobody. You and I, we can't influence anybody to become a Christian. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't save nobody. We can't put nobody in hell. We can't change nobody. We can't make people behave the way we want them to behave. We have to get it clear who we are not. In the spiritual realm, God is in control. Look at somebody and say, in the spiritual realm, God is in control. We know in any realm we're talking about our God is the sovereign God. He's in control. But as it, can, as it relates to what we're talking about in the scriptures, in the spiritual realm, God is in control. For us to know that and understand that, it will save us a lot of headaches. We think that we can change people's behavior by what we say or even manipulate them to see things our way. You and I don't have that kind of power. It's enough to try to keep our own selves in check. Can I get a witness? It's enough to keep our own self walking the straight and narrow. And then on many occasions, we blow that one. We have to end up before the sun set. Lord, help me keep my tongue. You trying to tell me about somebody else's tongue, but your tongue is out of control. You trying to point out somebody else's beam in their eye, and you've got two 
hole sticking out of the right one and three in the last one. God is the only one who operates in the spiritual. We got to understand that. Who are you? Who are you, John? If you're not one of them, tell us then give us an idea from your perspective in your own words. Tell us who do you say you are? We have come from the word of God. We've come from the prophets. We've gone all the way back to Moses. So you explain to us who you are. Here's point two. To effectively point others to Jesus, we need to be clear on who we are. It's one thing to be clear on who you're not, but you need to be clear on who you are. John was very clear on who he was. He was very clear on his role in God's economy, in God's plan, in God's scheme of things. John was very clear on who he was, what his role was, what he was supposed to do, what he was supposed to say. It was no doubt. Amen. And his interchange, his conversation at this point with these leaders brings out three positive ways that John views himself. And I want you to see this. How did John view himself? Well, in verse 23, he said, now, he's responding to their last question. And what was their last question? Their last question was, who do you say? What do you say about yourself? He simply said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm a voice. Now, and, and here's his message. Make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord of the Lord as Isaiah the prophet said I am a voice in the wilderness preaching the word oh y'all didn't get that one he didn't, he didn't get that one I am a voice in the wilderness preaching the word they didn't have the Old Testament I mean they didn't have the New Testament then only thing John had was the Old Testament and so he's preaching the word. He's preaching what he had. I am the voice, and I am preaching as Isaiah the prophet said. I am a voice. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now, he is citing Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. That's, that's where this text comes from, verse 3 from chapter 40. And the point of the quotation is that it gives no preeminence to the preacher whatever. It gives no preeminence to the preacher whatever. It doesn't shine any kind of light on the preacher. He didn't say, I am the great voice, referring to by Isaiah in the scriptures. He did not say, I am the important voice, the voice that will forever change the course of the world. <laughs> this is my exalted role. Rather, he is just a voice. A voice. I'm not the voice. I'm just a voice. All, all, I'm just a voice. Everybody here got a voice. Yes, Your voice ain't no more important than mine. <laughs> but you got to realize you got a voice. Hallelujah. And your voice is to proclaim what God leads you to proclaim. John the Baptist says, I am simply a voice. And he's calling attention. His whole ministry was to focus, was to point to the coming of Jesus. Praise God. The imagery that's used here was that before a king would visit a town, we've, and we've spoken on this several times, before an important person or king or ruler would come to visit 
a particular region or a town, they would send out a messenger. They used the term a herald. H-E-R-A-L-D. Y'all thought I couldn't spell it. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for that help. They would send out a herald, someone who would go before, who would go up and down the path that this ruler would be traveling, and they would send out a message announcing the coming of this important person. Now, the reason for that was would be that the townspeople would gather, hurry up, line the streets, be ready to pay homage to the one who was coming. They would make sure that there would be no obstacles in the way, uh, making sure that the road would be smooth for the riding apparatus of the of the one coming and to fill in any any holes to to make sure that everything was spruced up if the house needed to be washed the paint to give proper honor to the one that was coming and John says that's 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 my job and he's clear on this he's clear on a king is coming a king is coming, mm -hmm. and my job is to let you know he's coming, mm -hmm. and my job is to get as many obstacles out of the way, mm -hmm. to do as much whitewashing as I need to make sure you're presentable. So when the kings come, when the king comes, you can not only hear his message, but hear it and receive his message. Mm -hmm. He was just one coming before the important one. Notice the term wilderness here. Wilderness. Wilderness. It played a large, the term played a large role in, in Judaism. For if you recall, it was in the wilderness that the tabernacle was established. It was in the wilderness that their first victory was won after they had been delivered from Egypt. It would be in the wilderness that they would be able to connect to God in a spiritual way. John is out here in this wilderness speaking a very rough, vigorous message. He says, I am one who's trying to make straight the way of the Lord. I am making straight the way of the Lord. I'm preaching what the prophet, what the prophet Isaiah told me. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. Why is that important? Well, because they are not satisfied with his response again. And so is to emphasize, man, you're wasting our time. You're not telling us what we need to hear. And so they asked him, okay, we got your message then. Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, and if you're not the prophet? Why were you baptizing? Here's number two. John saw himself as the one who baptizes, but I want you to get the, the importance of his baptism. His baptism was the baptism of repentance and water. Make note of that. John's baptism was the baptism of repentance and water. So they asked him, why are you baptizing? Now, now John could have gone into a very lengthy discussion concerning himself and the role of himself as being the baptizer. <clears throat> But again, his reply with regard to himself is as brief as possible. And then he's going to direct everything to Christ, as you're going to see in verse 26. He makes his remarks about his ministry and about himself as brief as possible before he points people to Jesus. He's, I baptize in water, verse 26, but among you stands one whom you do not know. You don't know about it now, but, but he's right there in your midst. And, 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 and something that Jesus was actually 
in the not only the area, Jesus could have actually been in that crowd. When, when, when John says this, but among you stands one whom you do not know. John will wait till the next day to draw attention to him, John the Baptist baptism and the baptism that Jesus would baptize. Jesus would baptize in the Holy Ghost. In verse 28, John would identify the location where John was baptizing. Definitely beyond the Jordan. And that is going to distinguish between where they are and where they came from. Now let's talk for a moment about John's baptism. I want you to be clear on this church. John's baptism was very unique. It was common for Gentiles who would switch over from their pagan religions and come over to Judaism to, Judaism, to, 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 Judaism, to be baptized. And to be baptized was to identify them leaving their pagan religion and coming into the full scope of being a Jew. Some Jewish communities practiced self-baptism for cleansing. There was a cleansing aspect of Judaism. This is why you had that big labor in front of the first part of the tabernacle as the priests would get ready to go in from coming from the brazen altar, they would stop by the golden labor, the brazen labor, rather, and they would wash their hands and their feet. Cleansing, coming into the presence of God, was very important to them. But John was doing the baptizing, and he was doing it on Jewish people. He wasn't baptizing Gentiles. This was what was unique about John baptizing. He was baptizing those who supposedly had been baptized. Amen. He was baptizing his own, even calling his own Jewish religious leaders, calling on them to repent, calling on them to baptize. Turn over here to Matthew chapter 3. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3. I know you don't believe me, but let's go to the Word of God. Matthew chapter 3. I know you're already there. Here we go in verse number 7. Matthew 3 and verse number 7. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, who is the them? The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they're coming to be baptized of John the Baptist. Another way he said, you broad of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, you said, just don't go down in the water. When you come up, show, show some sign. There got to be some fruit to what you say you got. And he said, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. In other words, they will say, hey, 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 I'm saved simply because of my heritage. I can trace my heritage all the way back to Abraham. And what God the Baptist said, that's not good enough. He said in verse 10, the axe is already laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. Now he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff, with unquenchable fire. Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. First thing that I want you to know about John's baptism is that it was a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism of repentance. When we talk about the baptism of John, we're talking about the baptism of what? <laughs> repentance, in which those being baptized, they would confess their sins, 
and then they would prepare themselves for the coming kingdom of God. And John here is exhorting those being baptized to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance as opposed to simply relying on their Jewish heritage for the right to stand in the presence of God. They're saying that I can stand in the right of the presence of God because I am of the lineage of Abraham. John is saying you got to have some proof that you've been saved. All right. mm -hmm. It's just not enough for you to say you're saved. Hear me, church. Amen. It's not enough for you to go around saying you are Christian. Mm -hmm. It's easy for folks to go around saying, I'm a Christian. I don't know too many people who don't say they're Christian. Amen. I run up on conversations all the time, especially in Walmart. I hear people talking about God. They got Jesus on the car. They talking about God told them this and God showed them this. And the next breath they cussing up a star. And they storming out and they and they talking about who they gonna hook up with, hang out with. I heard that conversation not too long ago when I was in Walmart. That's why it's so fresh in my mind. But you look at their car, we belong to this church. I, Jesus is my pilot. I'm a Christian. People call themselves Christian. You can look on television and get the Christian charter. You can look on Christian radio, listen to Christian radio, and learn how to speak like a Christian. Go to some services and pick up some verbiage. But that does not make you a Christian. Amen. Amen. When God comes into your life, something's going to change. Amen. Amen. That's right. Uh -oh. Amen. See, Pastor, you need to stick with John the Baptist. <laughs> That's your problem. You do all right as long as you teaching us in the Word. Now you're going to get to editor time. Here's <laughs> my editor. I'm going to help me say it correctly. I'm looking at me oh, with that cute smile. You see, I'm struggling with the Word. Help me out, baby. Help me out. Stop laughing. You're going to bring that spirit under control. Help me out. What word am I trying to say? Thank you, editorializing. <laughs> we can't go by just because everybody said they're Christian. That's right. That's right. There's gonna be some fruits. You want you wanna right. Jesus teaches us, the New Testament teaches us there are signs that we are Christian. Amen. 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 We have a different we have a different mindset. Amen. We can bring ourselves under control. All right. We got control over ourselves. Amen. Amen. We don't have to say everything that comes out of our mouth. We're, we're, there's a different lifestyle for a Christian. Yes, right. And I know in this day and time, in this, in, in, in this world, in this, in this economy, uh, uh, people don't like to people do not like to identify themselves as being different. <laughs> Christians look different. We don't look like the world. That's right. Amen. 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 Even you, oh, you get ready to go old school now, Pastor. <laughs> we look different. We don't wear everything the world wears. That's why the Word of God teaches us we dress modest. Mm -hmm. We don't bring attention to our bodies. We're not there to flirt. Mm -hmm. They're to allure the opposite sex. Our lifestyle is different. Our mind is toward the things of God. We can forgive folks. Amen. 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 We can forgive people. Yes, can we can? Yes, we can. We can forgive people. Why? How come we can forgive them? Because Jesus forgave us. Amen. I said we can forgive people. Amen. Why? Because Jesus forgave us. Amen. Look at your neighbor and tell them, we can let stuff go. We can let stuff go. Why can we let stuff go? Because Jesus yeah. let it win. Huh? Amen. He don't keep on bringing it up to you. What you just did last night, I ain't talking about five years ago when you got saved. But let's talk about last night. <laughs> when it wasn't nobody but you in your mind. You got things going across your mind. Ain't got no business being there. When you had said stuff, looked at stuff, did stuff. <laughs> It's gone. Thank you, Jesus. It's strong and we'll for forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. That's why we you. celebrate communion, because we have to celebrate the fact that Jesus doesn't apply it to our account. When God looks at our record, he only sees what Jesus did. Amen. And Jesus lived the perfect life. Amen. This is what Jesus went through 30, 
He went through 30 some years. He lived a perfect life. You and I, we can't live a perfect life. And we ain't gonna lie about love with Jackie. We 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 can't live a perfect life. Amen. 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 And we don't live a perfect life. Amen. But praise God for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. Amen. So you can let stuff go. We can forgive. Because we're Christians. So I was about to say, show some proof to you, Christian. Amen. The second thing that I wanted you to see about his baptism is his baptism anticipates the coming Messiah the coming messianic baptism with the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's talking about when Jesus, the Messiah, would come, after him or with him would be coming the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we want to include fire. It would be a sign to point people to the coming of the Messiah. John may also have been uh, uh, seeing his particular ministry as a particular rite or passageway into receiving the Holy Spirit because the Old Testament prophets would often perform symbolic acts to make their message more uh, uh, valid, to make their message more clear, to make their message more accessible to the people. Uh, John may have been symbolizing through the baptism the Old Testament prophecies that spoke of God cleansing his people before the coming of the Messiah. That's when we read such passages as Ezekiel chapter 36 or Ezekiel 37 or even Zechariah chapter 13 as God cleansing his people before the coming of the Messiah. But as with his role as a voice crying out in the wilderness, he was the baptizer. He was preparing the people for the coming of the Lord. He was preparing the people for the Messiah. He was not building up his own following. Now there's a third way that John saw himself, and the third way follows right in line with the first two. We have to skip in verse 27. Are you with me? He said, it is good. It is he who comes after me. It is he who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, who would do that in their economy? A slave would. That was the job of a slave, to tie his shoes, to tie their shoes. I was trying to tie my shoes this morning, and I had the scripture on my mind. I said, oh, I wish I had a shoe tie. <laughs> Y'all, you're laughing at me. Some of y'all are either there or you will be there. <laughs> I got that, um, I, 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 I got that, um, uh, it's a sock something. You seen that commercial? <laughs> it works. <laughs> it works. The only thing I know, I got to get the top shoe. <laughs> Here, number C. He said, John saw himself as the lowly slave of Jesus. After telling the religious leaders that they did not know the one standing among them, John continues to describe himself. And he describes himself in verse 27. It is he who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. John saw himself as being a lowly slave. Jesus being the worthy master that John wasn't. John saw himself as being so unworthy that he was not even qualified to tie up the sandals of Jesus. <clears throat> Point people to Christ, saints, we got to join John in esteeming ourselves less and exalting Christ more. Amen. Amen. Esteeming ourselves less Amen. and exalting Christ more. Esteeming ourselves less and exalting Christ more. Now, I know that's hard in this religious climate that we live in. Mm -hmm. Because in this religious climate, it is very capitalistic. We have very much capitalistic churches. It's all about you. 
It's all about you getting more. Become a Christian so you can get this. Become a Christian so you can get that. It becomes very capitalistic. The philosophy of America has now overtaken the church. And that philosophy is all about you in church. I'm here to declare it ain't got nothing to do with you. Amen. 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 It's all Amen. about Christ. Yes, yes. All about it. It's all about Christ. All about it. Yes. This is what we learned about John mm. the Baptist in these yes. in, in these messages. Beautiful. Extending ourselves less and exalting Christ Amen. more. People don't need to be impressed with you. Amen. They need to be impressed with Jesus. Because yes. you can't heal nobody. Amen. They don't need to be impressed with you. Amen. They need to be impressed with Jesus. Amen. You can't comfort nobody. Ooh. They don't need to be impressed with you. They need to be impressed with Jesus. You and I can't save nobody. Amen. Only Jesus can. Amen. Now, the world is always going to give you opportunities to extend yourself. The world is always going to give you opportunities to place yourself on a higher pedestal than you belong. But only those who are growing in godliness... Only those who are growing in holiness, only those who are growing in the Word of God, only those who are under the control of the Holy Spirit will see themselves as being unworthy slaves to Jesus. The world may ask, are you the Christ? Are you little gods? <coughs> well, they may not go as so far as to answer yes. There are plenty self-inflated preachers, self-inflated people, self-inflated churchgoers who will say, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. What? I can speak tongues. I can speak in tongues whenever I want to. I can lay hands whenever I want to. It's all mine. I can see dreams. I can see visions. I can speak prophecies whenever I want to watch. And count of three, the whole church go, one, two, three, boom, there it is. <laughs> so sad. No, I'm not the Christ. But hopefully you see a little resemblance. Amen. No, preacher, I'm not the Christ. But hopefully if you hang with me long enough, you will I'll begin to sound like you. <laughs> uh, uh just maybe a uh, a little bit, you, you will say, oh, oh then you must be a Christian because you, you, you act like him. I, I am not the one, but I can help point you to the one. Yeah. I'm not Elijah. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not the prophet. I may want to be like him, but I'm not him. Here's my third point. Here's my third point. You're probably ready to go. Here's the third point. When we're clear on who we are in God's kingdom, then we can effectively point others to Christ. Now you don't have that on your bulletin, so you got to write that down. When we are clear on who we are in God's kingdom, we can effectively point others then to Christ. We'll see more on how John pointed these religious leaders to Jesus in our next study. In the study following, we'll see how he even pointed, how John even pointed his own disciples to Jesus. At this time, John has disciples following him. But as we move toward the end of this chapter, John is even going to point his own disciples, and they will, some of them will leave John and follow Jesus. He wasn't trying to hang on to them for himself. He wasn't trying to build a legacy. He wasn't trying to build the John the Baptist Ministries Incorporated. Well, he wasn't trying to go international. It wasn't John the Baptist International Ministries here. He must increase, but I must decrease. That was his model. When he gave out flyers, the only thing that said was he must increase but I must decrease 
When he gave out buttons to put on, he said, the only thing on his buttons were, he must increase, I must decrease. When he gave out stickers to put on the back of the chariots, the only thing that it said was, he must increase, and I must decrease. Man. Good rule to keep that in mind when you get a chance to talk to somebody about spiritual things. Don't be so quick to show how spiritual you are and what you know. Point people to Jesus. Everything hangs on to who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us on the cross. If people are going to be delivered, it's going to depend on who we understand him to be and what he did for us on the cross. And every sinner needs to know who Jesus is. And they need to know that Jesus was Savior and that Jesus is Lord. Especially true for church sinners. Individuals who come to church and see themselves as Christians simply because they've showed up but have not, never made, have not made a conscious decision to receive Jesus Christ into their lives. John Easley could have thought that these religious uh, uh, leaders were altogether spiritual themselves. They, they claimed to be spiritual. They, 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 they had on the, 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 the spiritual clothes. They came from the Sanhedrin. They, they, they looked religious. They kept the law of Moses. They went beyond the law by tithing. They kept the rituals of cleansing. They prayed. They did all of the outward, observable, religious things. But their hearts were far from God. Their hearts was not in tune with the, our churches today are full of people who lift the part, who sing the part, who dance the part, who give every indication that they are Christians, but within their for a moment. Yes, the true cause show. John didn't take it for granted because they looked apart. The he gave the same message to everybody who came to him. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. I got to point you to Jesus. Amen. They need to be confronted with Jesus. Yes, yes. We need to confront people with Jesus. Yes. Even those who sit up in church. They need to be confronted with Jesus. Every once in a while, we need to ask them, how do you know you're saved? You need to know. You need to know that you're saved. You need to know what that's based upon. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. We need to confront each other and remind each other, you're a Christian. Go out here next week and you live like a Christian. Go out here next week in the community and show, let the light shine in the midst of darkness. Let me close this up. Here's my last point. What lessons do I want us to learn from this? I, I think I got, I got two of them. So here we go. Give these lessons from this testimony. This testimony. Here, number one, John's example is a powerful one for us Christians, especially us ministers. Us ministers, who are those who are, who are elders and preachers. It's not about establishing our own ministries. It's not about establishing our own credentials and who we are. We are simply agents. We are simply channels that the word of God comes through pointing people to Jesus. As followers of Christ, our task is similar to the role of the forerunner, John. Point people to Jesus. Live right. Point people to Jesus. Speak right. Point people to Jesus. Walk in holiness. Walk in righteousness. Point people to Jesus. Be righteous parents. Point your children to Jesus. Be righteous neighbors. Point people to Jesus. Be righteous co-workers. Point people to Jesus. Point people to Jesus. Do you have A and B? Deflect attention away from ourselves. Deflect attention away from ourselves. And point people to Christ. 
Let us never forget, no matter how honored we may be, we are not Christ. No matter how well people talk of us, we're not Christ. Amen. Don't sit there and take all their glory. Amen. If you spoke well, it was because he spoke it through. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you, Lord. If you did something good, it was because he gave it to you. Yes, yes, yes. If your marriage is working, it's only because he's working. Amen. It ain't because you hit it on all cylinders. <laughs> Come on, come on, preacher. I think, I think now I need to, we need to start a, uh, uh, we need to start a, our own personal marriage ministry now. To, you know, we've been together 40 years. And, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we, we got a handle on this thing. God forbid you are lying from the pit of hell. I know I can say it without a shout of a doubt. I know other the band just shouting up and down there. In 40 years, I've only seen her dance once in church, but I bet she can dance on this one. If it wasn't for God, Amen. in the relationship of Jake and Deborah, it wouldn't be together. God kept us. God is keeping us. When Jake was acting a fool, she stood on the word of God. And when she was acting crazy, I know some of y'all don't think she can act crazy. <laughs> Only thing you got to do is just ask Jalen and Joy. That's all you got to do is get my two little red babies. Isaiah's a little bit, he's a little bit grown now, but he, he knows that grandma can go on. But if you want to know how crazy she is, ask Jalen and Jordan. They will tell you she's crazy. <laughs> Got to stand on the word of God. Amen. Sometimes both of us got to stand on the word of God for ourselves. Stand on the word of God for our children. We got to stand on the word of God coming against our own attitude. Sometimes my attitude stinks. Sometimes her attitude stinks. We got to stand on the word of God. We got to come together. Amen. We have to make a declaration. Hey, no, no, no. Satan ain't coming to this. Oh no, sometimes I gotta grab her. I ain't let you go till you look at me and, 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 and give me that girlish smile that I saw before you. I ain't let you go! Amen. Till we talk to Jesus. Amen. I don't gotta talk to Jesus right now. I am talking to you. We talking to Jesus. I ain't got nothing else to say. We going before the throne room. Because if I say something, it ain't gonna be the right. Point people to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Not your church. Not your pastor. Point them to Jesus. Amen. 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 To Jesus. Amen. I got four things in the in the conclusion. Did you, did you put that up? Okay, well, I got it. Here we go. Here's my conclusion. Here are four lessons from John the Baptist on how to evaluate accurately who you are so that you can point people to Jesus. Number one, if you're only into religion rather than Christ, you will, number one, flatter yourself with your religious performance rather than humble yourself in the holy presence of God. Number one is flatter, and the second blank of that is to humble. Secondly, you can only evaluate yourself correctly and point people to Jesus to the extent that you truly know him. If you don't truly know him, you can't point people to who Christ is. Here's third, humility is essential for a correct view of yourself, but self-esteem is detrimental. Self-esteem is detrimental. And number four, whatever your gifts and callings are, you can do as John did and use them simply to point people to Jesus. You get all that? No. I got you. Here's number one. 
If you're only into religion rather than Christ, you will flatter yourself with your religious performance rather than humble yourself in the holy presence of God. So for number one, there was flatter and then humble. Here is number two, you can only elevate yourself correctly, elevate correctly, and point people to Jesus to the extent that you truly know him. Elevate correctly and extend for number two. Number three, humility is essential for a correct view of yourself, but self-esteem is detrimental. Number three, self-esteem is detrimental. We got that. Here's number four. Whatever your gifts and callings are, whatever your gifts and callings are, you can do as John did and simply use them, your gifts and your callings, to point people to Jesus. Point people to Jesus. Part one, John's testimony of Jesus was simply, let me show you how to get to it. Let me point you to Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, once again, we're grateful for the words of our text. We're grateful for this testimony of this godly preacher, John the Baptist. We're grateful for the example of one who was gifted by you and used by you, but who understood his role, who understood his ministry and in our vernacular who stayed in his lane, preached a solid message. He preached the message that you gave him to preach. He was consistent in that message, and he told it to everybody, the rich, the poor, the, the religious, and the non-religious, but he did not take the credit. He did not seek to bring glory to himself. He sought to exalt Christ. God, I pray that as we are about to leave this room today and go out into the community, there will be many opportunities for us to exalt ourselves, even in our own minds. Others will try to exalt us, but God, may we intentionally seek to be humble, stay at the feet of Jesus, humble ourselves before the Lord, and help people understand what I am is because of Jesus. What I have is because of what he has blessed me with. I know I'm smart at this and I have this talent to do this, but it's because of the presence of the Holy Spirit who lives within me. And the Holy Spirit lives within me because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I have the finished work of Jesus Christ because God so loved me. May we point people to Jesus. May we point our children to Jesus. May they not grow up thinking that this is the work of their parents, but let them know that if we did not have Christ in our lives, our lives would be a mess. So God, may we be sensitive this upcoming week in all that we say and all that we do. You will give us opportunities to let the light shine in the midst of darkness. And may we let that light shine boldly, without apology. And we not be ashamed of who we are as Christians. As the enemy will seek to cause us to speak on our own behalf, to defend our own causes, and, 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 and to do what we ourselves feel like is right. May we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who would tell us that he must increase and we must decrease. May we be reminded of that this week. Jesus must increase. I, J, must decrease. Jesus must increase. J must decrease. Jesus must increase. J got to decrease. Thank you for your word this morning. It was safe passageway. We do pray for our own sister Carla. May you strengthen her and her body. Give her strength to continue her ministry. And God, thank you for this congregation. Ears who have ears to hear what the word of God is saying. Thank you for their faithful attendance. Thank you, God. Thank you. 
for being able to share with them what you have given to me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.